I'd like to introduce our first speaker this morning, uh, Dr. Corey Cutler. Um, he's a, an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and is a senior physician in the Division of Hematology Oncology, Department of Medical Oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Dr. Cutler graduated from McGill University's Faculty of Medicine, completed a residency in internal medicine at the McGill University Health Science Center, and completed fellowship training in hematology, medical oncology, and stem cell transplantation at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Dr. Cutler earned his MPH degree at the Harvard School of Public Health. Currently, Dr. Cutler is the director of the American Society of Blood and Marrow Transplantation, co-chair of the CIBMTR GVHD Working Committee, and is on the Clinical Trials Advisory Committee of the CIBMTR. Dr. Cutler is on the editorial boards for the journals Biology of Blood and Marrow Transplantation, Bone Marrow Transplantation, and the American Journal of Hematology. He has been a contributing author on more than 75 peer-reviewed publications and 20 reviews and book chapters. His research focuses on development of novel methods of acute and chronic graft-versus-host disease prophylaxis and therapy, umbilical cord blood transplantation, and decision theory in stem cell transplantation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Corey Cutler. Thank you for that nice in, um, introduction and the invitation to speak here. So I'll first start by saying that I'd like to think that I'm speaking early this morning because I need to get out early to meet the snow and get into Boston. The truth is I totally messed up my flights um, and uh, I'm supposed to be flying when my original talk was scheduled. So that's the truth. So I was um, asked to talk to you today about conditioning regimens in transplantation and uh, we'll spend about 35, 40 minutes talking about that. The, the challenge when one breaks apart one of the integral parts of uh, the transplant process is that you can't look at one individual component in isolation. And so we'll talk about conditioning regimens, but we'll have to speak about them in reference to everything else that's going on in the transplant experience. So uh, when uh, I'm asked by my patients or colleagues, what's the right conditioning regimen for my patient? The answer is there, there really never is one optimal conditioning regimen. There are dozens, if not nearly a hundred potential regimens out there, and choosing the exact correct one is probably not possible, so you shouldn't get yourself worked up into a sweat to try to do that. The basic foundations in, in conditioning uh, theory are that there are three levels of intensity that we like to describe in conditioning regimens. So we all understand what a myeloablative regimen is. This is a regimen that leads to prolonged and in fact nearly permanent uh, suppression of hematopoiesis. Once you get below the myeloablative threshold, there are two levels of conditioning intensity. We call them reduced intensity and non-myeloablative. And the line between these two is uh, far blurrier. But both of these lead to hematopoiesis that will recover if you support your patient long enough uh, without administering stem cells. So there have been a couple attempts to try to actually formally define what is a myeloablative regimen and what is less than myeloablative. There have been a couple of uh, publications to actually formalize these. Uh, on the right-hand side is the definitions proposed actually by CIBMTR at a consensus conference with Andreo Bacigalupo as the first author. And on the left-hand side is a, a European uh, counterpart, if you will. So according to the CIBMTR, an ablative regimen is anything that contains more than five gray of radiation in a single dose. So that's a one-shot deal of five gray or greater than eight gray when fractionated or any regimen that contains busulfanidose of greater than eight milligrams per kilo. As you can see on the left-hand side, the European definitions are a little broader, including combinations such as standard busi, which contains eight megs per k at least, melphalan at doses 150 milligrams per meter squared, and busulfan greater than nine. 
once you get into the less than ablative regimens, things become a little bit more divergent. So we all are familiar with regimens like single dose TBI with fludarabine, sort of a, a Seattle type, very low intensity regimen. And there are a whole bunch of other regimens that include nucleoside analogs, fludarabine, cladribine, et cetera. Um, but these definitions start to um, become divergent. Now again, this non-myelablative refers to the ultra low. So these are regimens that are just sufficient to immunosuppress the patient enough to get a graft in. The Europeans went on to define what is included in a reduced intensity regimen, so this is the middle ground, and uh, they sort of excluded everything that wasn't in the other two slides. The, the CIBMTR actually couldn't come up with a definition and just said, if it's not non-myelablative and it's not ablative, then it must be reduced intensity. And so why does one choose an ablative, a reduced intensity, or a non-myelablative regimen? Well, what it comes down to is the requirement of an anti-tumor effect of the conditioning regimen itself balanced by the risk of regimen-related toxicity that you're going to incur by giving that regimen. <clears throat> so we all know that if we give high-dose BUSI or psi tbi we run the risk of things like veno-occlusive disease and the pneumonitis syndromes, etc. But when we give regimens such as low-dose fludarabine and the single dose of TBI, one doesn't get all that much tumor kill out of that. So the decision to choose one regimen or the other is really quite situational. So for example, if you have a 21-year-old in front of you who's got adverse risk leukemia in first remission, this is a kid who you're going to try to provide the utmost amount of anti-tumor therapy you can, even at the expense of extra toxicity, because 21-year-olds can take it. On the other hand, with an elderly person in front of you with CLL, perhaps a disease that doesn't actually respond to high-dose therapy, you really get nothing by giving this person high-dose intensity therapy because it's not going to provide tumor kill and it's just going to provide excess regimen-related toxicity. So this is someone who you would choose a reduced intensity or a non-myeloblative regimen. And so the factors that go into what we, um, what the factors that we use to try to decide what type of regimen are things like who are you actually transplanting? Is this a younger or older individual? Do they have comorbidities that you need to be aware of? Do you need the anti-tumor activity in the conditioning regimen, or are they actually in a deep remission at the time of their transplant? And is their disease susceptible to graft versus lymphoma so that we can just rely on the immune effects of the transplant? When people have compared outcomes, that is, looked directly at reduced intensity versus myeloblative regimens, what's very impressive is that the, the message is always the same. So this was the first large comparison of reduced intensity and, non and ablative regimens from the CIBMTR. About 550 patients were included. And as you can see here, the curves are entirely superimposable. This is for all diagnoses and, and all, pay, all comers, but uh, a pretty clear uh, graph showing that there's really no difference in long-term outcomes. Similarly, a paper from the Europeans that did the same thing. You can see that the curves all cross and are relatively superimposable, suggesting that at the end of the day, the outcomes are probably no different. Now, there's a lot of uh, selection bias here. So physicians and their patients choose which of these regimens. And the fact that we can't improve on outcomes from one to the other you know, either Im implies that we're making good choices and we're doing the best we can, or that at the end of the day, it just doesn't matter. I'd like to think it's the former. Um, this is the exact same analysis that we did at our institution. And the reason why I'm showing you a smaller version of this is to demonstrate the components that go into this survival curve. So this is a group of 50 to 60-year-olds transplanted at our institution, uh, all of whom were between the ages of 50 and 60, I believe. And again, as you can see, the long-term survival is identical for the myeloblative and non-myeloblative groups. That's statistically not a, a difference uh, between these two curves out here. That's statistically the same. But here's how the problems with these regimens broke out. So if one looks at the uh, relapse and death from relapse rate in the non-myeloblatives, that's this line here, it's the highest of them all. 
So this is a low intensity preparative regimen for a disease that we think requires intensity, like leukemia. Counterbalanced is the toxicity or treatment related mortality of this regimen. So this is the low intensity group and they have the absolute lowest regimen related mortality or TRM. These are the same two curves from the ablative group. So more toxicity, but less relapse. And so at the end of the day, the curves become the same for overall survival. And so it's sort of like choose your poison. You have to decide how you want to get to the survival figure of X percent at the end of the year. It's just a question if you uh, have a preference for treatment-related mortality or, uh, talk or relapse of the disease. Um, more data from our center. We thought that perhaps slight increases in intensity might help. So this is an analysis looking at once versus twice daily busulfan in our patients. And as you can see here, very small differences in intensity actually didn't make a difference in our outcome. So um, the lower and the higher dose didn't actually change relapse rates or non-relapse mortality, leading to identical survival outcomes. Now, because we all choose what we think is the best regimen for our patients and the best intensity for our patients, and that's purely a physician and patient preference and choice, what the community has done is gotten together to try to answer the question whether one is actually preferable to another in a defined group of patients. And so this is CTN trial 0901, which is open at many centers across the country. And this is for patients with acute leukemia or MDS that need to have low blast counts going into transplant. And here we are randomizing, randomly assigning patients to either low intensity or high intensity preparative regimens. So the reduced intensity regimens are standard busulfan fludarabine that's used very widely and fludarabine melphalan also used fairly prominently. And then the myeloablative regimens are high intensity flubu standard BUSI or PSI TBI. And it's just a straight randomization one to one of the two regimens. And then we're going to be following these patients for approximately 18 months to determine where the overall survival advantage lies. And so if this is open at your center, this is actually a very fundamental question in our field. And I would encourage you to actually try to get your patients to participate in this trial. So once you're in the ablative spectrum, one has to ask, well, is myeloablation myeloablation? Are they all the same? And the answer is probably no. So it adds another level of complexity to your decision. You've now decided to do a myeloablative transplant. You still need to choose a myeloablative prep regimen for your patient. And so the two classic ablative regimens are PSI-TBI and BUSI. And people have asked for a long time whether these are equivalent because most centers choose one or the other and generally don't have both available widely. So for example, at our center, if you're having an ablative transplant, PSI-TBI has been our standard and we probably do fewer than five to 10 BUSI transplants a year and those are reserved for patients who've already had too much radiation. So in the past, for patients with leukemia, uh, there were five or six studies, three of whom suggested that TBI-based regimens perhaps were better than busulfan. CML, same thing, and for combination trials, TBI better than busulfan in one large synthesized analysis. And so here's what it looks like. Uh, sorry, this is for ALL. I must, must have missed a slide. So in AML, a little bit controversial. ALL, a little bit less controversial. So this is a meta-analysis of clinical trials that looked at uh, TBI-based regimens in lymphoblastic leukemia. So we've moved from myeloid to lymphoid leukemias. And I'll just orient you here. So this is a meta-analysis plot or a forest plot. This line here is the line of unity that suggests that there's no difference. Each one of these studies here is a little box with the size of the box being reflective of the effect size, and the lines on either side of the box are the 95% confidence intervals, 
you'll see that this one, the confidence interval, just about touches one, so makes it almost not significant, whereas these two trials, the confidence intervals are on the right side of one, suggesting that TBI is better. So individually, the three studies look like TBI is better, and in fact, when you combine them into this diamond-shaped plot, you see that it is, uh, comes with an odds ratio reduction of about 1.93-fold for mortality, suggesting that in ALL, TBI is the way to go. And that's something that hasn't changed in a long time. CML, we have no clue. You know, we don't transplant CML much any longer, so this is not really an analysis that's worth looking at. But what you can see here is that the diamond firmly crosses the one, so the 95% confidence intervals are between 0.44 and 2, and there's really no effect of TBI versus busulfan in chronic myeloid leukemia. Here's the plot for AML. That's a little bit out of place. Here, there is a suggestion from four trials that, in fact, TBI is slightly better. When one looks at the diamond, you'd have to blow it up a little bit to see. It actually doesn't cross this vertical line. The confidence interval is 1.01, so very close to 2.20, with an odds ratio reduction of about 50% or so, 1.5. So this suggests still, for these older trials, that TBI is the way to go. The problem is, is that there is some TRM, so treatment-related mortality. Here are the odds ratios for TRM for a whole bunch of studies. You can see that the majority of them fall on the side of the curve favoring TBI, again, so this is why the uh, overall results are better for TBI, because there's less treatment-related mortality. The problem is that things are not clear any longer, and there's now new data. So there were recently uh, three trials published in uh, prominent journals from prominent groups that actually suggested that the opposite trends have become true in more recent years. Now, part of that is because of the advent of intravenous busulfan in comparison to oral busulfan. So when we gave oral busulfan, it was much, uh, much harder to dose from a pharmacokinetic point of view. Many patients were overdosed and uh, suffered toxicity. But now that we have intravenous busulfan, which almost the entire field has moved over to, and the pharmacokinetics are much more reliable, uh, outcomes appear to be changing. So what we see in this uh, very large report from the EBMT is that if you compare Psi TBI to uh, BUSI, there is actually less graft versus host disease, 26 versus 42 percent. There is slightly less chronic GVHD, 50 versus 38 percent, and I'll just show you that these p-values are, are actually um, statistically significant. And uh, a very slight signal for increased relapse for BUSI. But at the end of the day, it looked like outcomes were better in that group. A similar retrospective analysis from the CIBMTR looked at comparison between IV BUSI, oral BUSI, and PSI TBI. And the curves get a little unstable out here, so you really can't look at this area of the curve. It's not fair. You have to sort of look out here at five years, where there's a very clear trend that IV BUSI is better than oral BUSI, which is markedly better than PSI TBI. And based on these type of reports, many centers are actually switching from TBI to busulfan-based regimens. And finally, this was a, a third study from the CIBMTR, a prospective cohort, not just a large retrospective review, that suggested very similar things. So busulfan-based regimens better than TBI in a large uh, prospective cohort. So this was not a randomized trial, but just patients were registered and followed forward rather than having their data collected at the time uh, of outcome analysis. So myeloblative regimens are actually currently, if you will, a moving target. And what matters most is what you do well at your individual center. So it happens that our center, we have an excellent radiation oncology group. We have a dedicated TBI suite, which many centers do not have. And that allows us to deliver uh, fairly stable doses of radiation to the vast majority of our patients. And quite frankly, we are not going to be switching despite this data, although we have moved a lot to reduce toxicity regimens. There is some bias 
there is the requirement to do oral busulfan pharmacokinetics if you're going to switch there, if you're going to stay with oral bu. So there are lots of things that go into your decision to use an ablative or reduced intensity regimen. But again, you can't look at this decision of which regimen you're going to use in isolation. So you need to consider what disease, stem cell source, risk of VOD, et cetera. And one of the reasons I'm going to just, just, just show you this for uh, an illustrative uh, view is this is the, the results of CTNO201, the, the uh, peripheral blood versus bone marrow trial that we all know about, which suggested no survival advantage for peripheral blood over bone marrow with an excess in chronic graft versus host disease. I would argue that I would take this 5% if I were a patient, but from the statistical point of view, this is really not a, a meaningful difference and the curves come together at the end. However, about 50% of the trial received TBI-based therapy. And in fact, if you look only at the TBI-based patients, the curves are entirely, uh, uh, are much wider apart. And in fact, the differences now are magnified. So there's greater than a 10% uh, improvement in survival at 12 and 24 months. And if you look at the median survival, the median survival in the peripheral blood TBI arm was twice as long as the median survival in the bone marrow peripheral blood arm. Now, this is not a predefined subgroup. You cannot use this data to definitively declare anything. I'm showing this only as an illustrative example that you need to look at all the components of what's going into your decision. So don't quote this data, please. So let's move on from ablative to the reduced intensity and non-myelablative setting. And we'll talk a little bit about reduced intensity regimens. And so here, um, there is an element of increasing the dose and the toxicity. You can start at the extraordinarily low T uh, TBI 2 gray regimens, move your way all the way up to uh, flu bu 8, so twice a day, busulfan with or without ATG. And the more drugs you give, the higher your myelosuppression, the more your immune suppression, and the higher your toxicity over time. Now, the critical thing in reduced intensity or non ablative transplant is that none of the regimens that we all use regularly have ever been tested against each other. They're all just as good until proven otherwise. You can use them interchangeably. And the reason why there are so many out there is because each individual center, when reduced intensity transplant sort of was born around 99, 2000, decided to develop their own regimen and has developed comfort around that regimen. So at our center, it's flu boo straight. That's all we give if you're getting a reduced intensity or reduced toxicity transplant. And that's fine. It's no different than flu psi you get in Seattle or flu TBI you get elsewhere. They're all the same until you've proven otherwise. Now, there are certain circumstances in which we give a particular type of conditioning regimen and where the conditioning regimen and the stem cell source really go hand in hand and there's only a few a a few ways to do things. And one of those scenarios is haploid identical transplantation. We'll get into cord transplantation in a few minutes. The advantages of haploid transplantation is that everyone has a haploid donor. So a parent, a child, and 50% uh, of your siblings will be haploid identical. The advantages over choosing uh, cord blood uh, for alternative donors is that uh, haploid donors are generally motivated because they generally like you if they're in your family and you can go back to the donor for cellular therapy. So if you need DLI or anything other uh, cellular uh, complex clinical trial things. Now there are disadvantages. Uh, so you're giving full haplotype mismatched transplants with a competent T cell compartment. And so you get a lot more graft versus host disease risk and a lot more risk of rejection because of the disparity between donor and recipients. And because of this, people have developed a couple of approaches to try to get around these problems. And I think it's worthwhile mentioning the approaches that, are, that were pioneered in Perugia and, then, uh, and in Asia that they use uh, commonly. And so here they use very, very, very high doses of hematopoietic stem cells and do extensive in vitro and in vivo T cell depletion as methods of trying to reduce the risk of graft versus host disease and overcome the rejection. But the approach that's much more commonly used in North America 
uh, was developed by Johns Hopkins, and I'll go over that regimen here, and you'll see that they've given it, uh, they've, they've given multiple different regimens, but this is how they originally uh, described their outcomes, and they gave a standard bucei, actually oral bucei, transplant with bone marrow, giving post-transplant cyclophosphamide. <clears throat> and in their original experience, this actually worked. So graft failure rates were relatively low, 2 to 8 percent, and most patients engrafted with an average of 23 to 25 days. Now this is bone marrow, that's why it took so long. The rates of graft versus host disease, not bad, 40 to 45 percent or so for related grade 2 to 4, and in the 10 percent range for severe GVHD. In the reduced intensity setting, <coughs> Excuse me. They've given a flu psi regimen with a single dose of TBI. Again, with outcomes shown here. The reason why I'm showing you these regimens is to show you that this is sort of the way we do it in North America. It's not to say that you couldn't give a different reduced toxicity regimen for the haplo group, but because this is so out there and so different from what we do on a general day to day basis, that most of us do not sort of sway from the regimen that they have described, particularly since most of us don't do all that many haplotransplants. So if you're going to decide to do haplos at your center, you are probably going to adopt this exact conditioning regimen as most of North America has done. <clears throat> In the cord setting, uh, there are multiple regimens out there as opposed to the haplo setting. And the cord regimens really fall along the full range of intensity, but all of them share one common link, is that they are all very immunosuppressive. So rather than being uh, sort of a nuclear bomb to the marrow and just make physical space for the cord to show up, the theme in cord blood regimens is that they need to be immunosuppressive to get by the immunologic barriers of engraftment. And so almost all cord regimens contain either TBI, which is extraordinarily immune suppressive, or antithymocyte globulin. And the reason, again, is that the risk of graft rejection is extraordinarily high in cord blood transplantation. Now, people have um, looked at outcomes in cord blood transplant. This is the reduced intensity uh, type regimen that we did in the cord versus haplo phase two studies. So this is CTNO604. And you can see that in a reduced intensity setting, the non-relapse mortality was 24%, so one in four patients at one year. When one looks at the ablative protocol that was uh, run by Juliet Barker through the RCI, so many of you might have been involved in this, the uh, regimen-related toxicity was much higher with 42% incidence of non-relapse mortality at two years. So that's a big number. You know, four out of ten of your patients will die of non-relapse causes by two years from transplant. So you need to be um, really convinced that an ablative transplant is the right thing for your patient undergoing cord blood transplantation. Now what about specific diseases? <clears throat> there are some diseases in which we almost never use myeloablative preparative regimens. And the reason for that is that diseases like these, the sort of the low-grade lymphomas and multiple myeloma, really are not amenable to high-dose therapy for the most part. Now, for one thing, most patients with Hodgkin's disease who are undergoing allogeneic transplant have already had an autologous transplant. So they've already had high-dose therapy, and they've failed it. And if you failed high-dose therapy once, there's no reason to suppose that going at it a second time with a second high-dose regimen is actually going to be helpful. Other diseases like CLL, follicular non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, these are often patients that are pretty beat up by having had multiple, multiple, multiple courses of chemotherapy to try to get them down to remission before attempting a transplant. And so in those type of patients, one doesn't want to provide excess toxicity with a high-dose preparative regimen. And in myeloma, these are generally older patients with um, most of whom will have subclinical kidney disease, and so putting them through an ablative regimen also is associated with a lot of toxicity. So there's almost no role for ablation 
with these specific diseases. There are, of course, always uh, exceptions to this rule, but uh, I would say the number of ablative transplants performed for these four indications is extraordinarily low. What about in chronic myeloid leukemia? Well, this is the disease that luckily the transplant community cut its teeth on. And the reason why I say we were lucky to have chosen this disease is that this disease is the most susceptible to graft versus leukemia. So as you all know, uh, you can give DLI for a relapsed case of CML and you can cure 75 to 80 percent of these people with a single dose of DLI, suggesting that there's really a very, very prominent immunologic effect of transplantation. Now, two things happened in CML to sort of prevent us from learning what the right way is to, uh, to, uh, to transplant them. And these two events occurred around the same time. They were the introduction of reduced intensity regimens simultaneous with the introduction of Gleevec. And so just when reduced intensity was hitting the ground, Gleevec came out, and our, um, our transplant volume for CML fell through the floor. So only recently have uh, reduced intensity regimens started to be explored for a disease like CML. And it turns out that because the graft versus leukemia effect is so prominent to this disease, it actually turns out that you can get by with reduced toxicity regimens for CML these days. And actually most patients do pretty well and you can still afford a fair bit of cure for these patients. <coughs> Excuse me. I've already told you before that in ALL, one is obliged to give TBI <clears throat> if possible. There are certain patients who are too frail, too old, or who you do not think will tolerate TBI. And in those patients, it's better to simply get a graft into them than it is to uh, bump them off with treatment-related toxicity. So you don't have to give TBI, but if you can, you should. For the myeloid diseases, this is a bit of my bias coming through. So I try to give as much conditioning as possible. I'm not saying that's the right answer, it's just what I do. Um, but I would recommend that everyone get their patients on 0901 so that we can actually answer the question of, increase, of whether increasing conditioning intensity actually matters. And maybe in a few years I'll come back and recant my bias. So a few more summary things. Um, this is supposed to be many exist, not may exist. So there are lots and lots of conditioning regimens for you to choose from. There is a ton of institutional bias. And part of the reason why our field is not moving forward quicker is because of this bias. So centers refuse to participate in clinical trials because the reduced preparative regimen in one uh, in the trial proposed is not what you're familiar with at your center and then people decide not to participate. But as I've told you, there are no comparisons between conditioning regimens that suggest that uh, one regimen is better than the other. Again, you cannot think about conditioning or preparative regimens in a vacuum. The decision on the conditioning regimen that you choose for your patient has to be taken into consideration with a whole bunch of other factors, the stem cell source, the donor source, the disease, the disease state, comorbidity, all of these other things. <clears throat> and finally, just to make our lives a little bit more difficult, there is very little data in this field. So the prospective randomized controlled trial, the gold standard in our field is there are few, there are few and far between. And even the registry studies at some level conflict with each other. So you can feel comfortable in making your own decisions and not feeling like you're doing the wrong thing based on data. And again, I would encourage for one, one more push uh, for CTN0901, which might help us answer the issue of conditioning intensity in a very defined group of patients with AML and MTS. And with that, I will uh, end, and I'll be happy to take questions. I think I'm about five, ten minutes early, so uh, thanks for your attention, and, and please, I'm happy to take some questions. <clears throat>